18. We're going to be in chapter 4 and 5 tonight. Um, yeah. Have you guys ever told someone something and you really wanted them to do it and they didn't? Or you told someone that they had two options and this one was a good option, but this one wasn't too great of an option. And they decided to go with this option. And that wasn't something you wanted them to do. But they did it anyways. The fun part of that is that's us almost every day. Let's, uh, let's read James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Go now. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I tie, since I'm going down to college, I, I figured this was a wonderful title for tonight. The Christian Life. 102. First point, the terrifying model of James 4.17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let's break down that verse. Knoweth Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good. So, the one that knoweth to do good, that means one who is not ignorant of right and wrong. Well, the Bible takes care of that for us in Genesis, when Adam took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, guess what? That means none of us are ignorant to what is right and what is wrong. That means if we don't do what is right, we're in the wrong. We are sinning. And doeth it not. Oh, I put that. I, I, I think that would be considered open rebellion or an open, dis, open decision against doing the right thing. Because we all know it. We all know what's right. But we don't do it. Awesome. And then the last part of that, that, the last part of that's super blunt. It is sin. So it's sin. If you don't do right, it's sin. If you don't, you, you, you know... You know what's good, but you may not do it, and therefore that's sin. Next, the tasks at hand. Point number two. Point number one was fairly short. Point number two, the tasks at hand. James 5, 7 through 20. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband... Men waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. But ye also, but be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren. The prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. 
Behold, we count them happy which endure. We have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the, in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So, in verse 17 of chapter 4, we see Tim that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, Tim it is sin. The very last verse of that chapter. And then we see it go into this, where it says, be patient. In verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So we need to be patient to reap those souls. There's some souls that it takes a little bit of time. It takes a lot of prayer. But you need to be patient. Wait for the early and latter rain. Wait for, for God to ripen them just where he wants them. And wait for that call from God. Next, in verse 8, it also it says, Establish your hearts. Amen. So ground yourself. Make sure that you are grounded in God's Word. Amen. I was sharing with the teenagers the other day um, that in order to be grounded, you've got to be in it. So if you're not in it, you can't be grounded, and therefore you're already sinning because Tim that knoweth to do good doeth and not Tim it is sin. Each one of us know that we're supposed to read our Bible. If you're saved, you know you're supposed to read your Bible. But do you do it? Are you grounded? Are you working to be grounded if you're not? At Men and Boys Camp, we, uh, Stephen did a devotional about, I mean, from, uh, don't remember the passage right now, but he did a message, and part of, the, a lot of people started mentioning that you got to, that it, it talks about growing and growing together. And how the build a, a building is built on a foundation, which is Christ. And you've got to be built on that rock. Yeah. 
Verse 9, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. That, ju that judge is God. And just not too much further earlier, he said, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. And just right here, he said, grudge not. You have a grudge? Have someone that you really can't stand just because they did something that you didn't like. And now you just can't get over it. That's also unforgiveness, but it's sin because he says, grudge not. Verses 10 and 11. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. We have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, and the Lord is very, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Endure suffering with happiness. You're going through a hard time? He's the God of joy. Yeah. Have you approached him about it? He says, pray without ceasing. He, he loves talking to us. We don't talk to him. Um, but he really enjoys talking with us. And he asks us to. Through prayer. He, he wants to hear what we, what we have to say. And fairly often when we have things that go wrong, we bring it to him. But we never go and try to get his answer. But you can't endure suffering with happiness and joy if you don't have the joy. If you're not saved, you, you won't have the joy, period. Christ is the only one that can give you that joy. But if you're saved, that joy is found in here. Verse number 12, if I can get back to my spot. Verse number 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. So verse 12, what's it saying? Speak the truth. Every time, whether, whether it's going to make you look bad or not. First, don't lie. Because if you start lying, your yay is no longer yay, and your nay is no longer nay. And secondly, it's saying keep your word. Because if you're, if you're keeping your word, you'll never have to say, I promise I'll do this. Because your yay is still yay. And your nay is still nay. If you say yes, we can do this, then yes, you should do that. If you say no, then you're not doing that. Even if they ask a hundred more times, the answer is still no. Verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Pray when in pain. Pray, I mean praise, when joyful. When you're in pain, God wants to hear it. But he also wants to hear you praise him, both in that pain and... Especially when he's 
lifted you out of it, and your heart's merry. When God has given you everything that you think that he could give you, and more, you better be praising him. What's the point of him giving it to you if you're not going to give him any thanks for it? If, if you had this gift and you gave it to a child, and the child just grabbed it and ran off with it, are you going to give that child a gift again? Or do you expect that child to say, Oh, well, thank you. Do, you! do you expect at least a little bit of thanks? But we're the children of God. Most of the time we don't give him thanks. He's given us so much. He's, he, he get, he's given us the very breath we breathe. But we don't thank him for it. Down in El Salvador, we're, we were told not to drink the water. At all. We were only allowed to drink bottled water. So it became... It was very nice when I got home and I could drink out of the faucet. But no one ever thinks to thank God for the water we have. <laughs> the Somerville water, not the best water. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. It's still drinkable. So we need to thank God for that. Even if it's not your favorite thing, it's still better than what you could have. Matter of fact, you could be in hell. You could be burning where there's no water. Where you're wishing that you could just have a drop. Or that since you know you can't have a drop, you're wishing that they would send someone to those you know. And you never told. Verse number 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. We'll get to the next part in a second. Confess to one another. Verse number 16. Don't allow a sin that you do to your brother to keep you... You better go to that, that brother that you sinned against. Ask for forgiveness and you better... And if you were the one that was sinned against, you better for, say you're forgiven. God forgave you. But confess one to another. But that doesn't mean, oh... I ask for forgiveness. They're bound to forgive me because God forgave them. So now I can just go do this. No. If you're, ask, if you're asking for forgiveness, you better mean it. Now, does that mean that, they, that if, if they don't think you're sincere, that they should say no? No, I, I don't think you're sincere, so I'm not going to take that. They're, you're not God. You have no right saying whether this person is sincere or not. Forgive them whether they are or not. It's going to hurt you more if you don't. But also on top of that, confess one to another. Maybe it's a sin that you don't actually think really affected anybody else. For sake of example, if let's say you were single and you had gotten into pornography, you might not think that affected anybody else. Eventually, that will definitely affect your relationships, no matter what. But you need to go, and you need to confess that to someone who is older than you, someone who can keep you accountable. You need an accountability partner, because you will never get over it without an accountability And God designed that. He said to have, to grow together. So that means 
this guy here is a really good Christian. This guy's here a lukewarmish Christian. This guy's just just gotten saved, but he's 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 on fire for the Lord, but he's not very strong in his relationship. This lukewarm Christian should never have gotten lukewarm in the first place. And they should have been reaching up to try to grab the hand of this guy up here who's up here following, following Christ while this, and he should be reaching back to help them up. And this other guy should be reaching back to help this new Christian up so that everybody is, is helping each other to grow, encouraging each other. Next, six, 16, the end of 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then it gives an, an example. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I think so many of us, when we read that verse, when, you, when we read verse number 16, the part that says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, we're, we're thinking the, that that's long-lasting. Because that's what I thought at first. I thought that, that that effectual fervent prayer meant you believe it, but you, you keep praying it. That's not what it means, though. Effectual, fervent prayer. Effectual means effective or expecting. So, faith that it's going to happen when you pray. And then fervently is passionately. So we need, we need to be praying faithfully and passionately that God will do this or that. You need to expect that it will happen because guess what? He is the God who created the world. He can do it. No problem. No questions asked. You just have to ask Him. He's your Father. If you're saved, if you're not, you, you really need to. He's a great father. But if you're saved, he asks you. No, actually, correction, he doesn't ask you. He commands you by saying, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you know it'll, if you know it will avail much, then you know it's a good thing. Therefore, if you don't do it, it's sin. Move over in your Bibles to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to hit, we're going to cover three more points real quick like within this and then there's a little bit more so Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 23 let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised we need to hold Fast to your faith. If you, you had get saved, you need to hold fast to that faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, we know God exists because we see His creation. And therefore, we have faith he exists because 
of what we've seen, even though he's not seen, because there's evidence. But if we're not holding fast to that sin, if we're not standing up when our peers are like, when our peers are over here talking and cracking those bad jokes, if you're not holding fast and standing up, then you're sinning. Whether you like it or not. Verse number 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Consider one another. First, pray for each other. And that, that's commanded here because in considering each other to provoke unto love and to good works. Well, in considering each other, you're considering their entire spiritual life. And the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you're believing passionate prayer will help someone grow. Which is the second point. Helping each other grow. Reaching back and helping that guy who's behind you, who's a little bit less spiritually strong than you, reaching back and helping him. But also, at the same time, reaching forward to grab that hand who's a little bit further than you. But, if you see this guy wavering, maybe it's not wise to grab that hand. Maybe it's wise to stretch further and grab the hand in front of him. Keeping your eyes on Christ the entire time. Someone said that you need to follow your pastor as he follows Christ. We got a, an amazing pastor here. God's really blessed us. And we can follow him as he follows Christ. Now, if he was to ever waver in an area, our eyes should be on Christ, so we shouldn't waver in the same area he does. But we're following him while we look, keep our eyes on Christ. Look for someone that can help you grow. They may be younger, they may be older. It doesn't matter. The key is if they're, strong, if they're more spiritually strong or they're even stronger in a specific area than you are, you can learn from them and grow through, grow through their ministry in your life. But also, you can also, you also need to be looking for someone behind you who's a little bit weaker in this area or that area so that you can help them get to where you are now to grow the church. God grows the church, but he, he, needs, he, he, he wants faithful men to do it. But he, can't, but he won't have faithful men in this church if men in this church don't reach back and help these future generations get to where they are so that you have a faithful generation the next time to reach back and grab the next generation. Back in James, James chapter 5, you see verse 25. Verse number 20, no, that's not it. Oh, that was still in Hebrews. So back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, we are to exhort one another, help them grow, 
while not forget, forgetting to come together, that may not even be in church. There's, there is church, and you, you, should not, you should do everything within your power to stay in church. Every Sunday, every chance, the, every time those doors are open, and there's a service, you should be in here. But not just that, but it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Church services may not, they may or they may not get, like, get to where now we're having it Tuesday, th Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then uh, back to Sunday. So we have it three days of the week. It may not ever get to that. But where three or more are get, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's the assembling of yourselves together. So you should be assembling, praying. Matter of fact, the, one of the greatest churches in England, I don't remember what the pastor of it was, but he took a gentleman down to the basement asked the, after asking the gentleman if he wanted to see the power room. The guy said yes. He took him down to the basement, opened this door, and this man saw men all over on their knees praying. That is the power of God. That church is still around today. The pastor ended up dying because he's mortal and it is appointed unto man wants to die and after this judgment. But there were faithful men there to keep the church growing. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Last time I checked, Christ's coming is coming closer and closer. It's one day closer than it was yesterday. One week closer than it was last week. But most of us don't really actually care when we get to our real daily lives. We don't actually, we, we, we tend to completely forget that Christ is coming back to receive us. something he tells us to keep on our minds continually. Next, go back. you can go back to James. This time I'm not jerking your chain. The last two verses in James chapter 5. Bringing souls to Christ. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Bringing souls to Christ. It's like, for sake of example, I need you two to come up here real fast. It's, it's, it's like I was over here talking to Timothy and Corbin's over here walking that direction. And I got a call from God. And I see it's God and it's like, oh no. I don't want to answer him. I, I don't want to go talk to him. So, so I, I'm, ju I'm just going to put my phone back in my pocket. I'm going to ignore the call from God to go witness to that soul who's ready get saved. So many of us do it. And don't think about it. You guys can sit down. So many of us, every day, there's someone that passes by that we could have witnessed to. Someone that we could have either planted a seed, watered it, or Lord willing, reap the harvest. 
every day. But we each claim to be a good Christian. But to him that knows to do good and doeth it not to him. So each one of us are sinning because we know that we need to witness to that young man or that young woman because they need Christ. We may see them every day at work for years, but we never witness to them because we're afraid of what they'll think of us. What do they think of you as a Christian because you're not willing to actually put your faith to work? What do they think of your God? Do they think he's a loving God? Based off your testimony? Or would they think, oh, he's just another, another character, another, another guy that, another Jesus freak, another guy who claims to be a Christian, but his, his te- yeah, he, he doesn't go out and drink beer with me, but other than that, he acts just like me. Or do you try to win them to Christ every day? Yeah, maybe it might not be the best place to start to stop. It might not be the best idea to stop working and try to talk to this guy and lead him to Christ. But for just one more soul. And I'm sure you have a break or a time out of work where you can talk to him or her. God puts people into our lives. Every soul we don't talk to is blood on our account. James chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. Go now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go in, into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the, tomorrow, on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we, sh- we shall live and do this or that. And then verses five, 7 and 8 of chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Verse 13, not later today. It's now. It's it's not later today, it's now. Not tomorrow. Also found in verse 13. But now. Why? Why? You find in verse 14 and 15. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Or even later that day. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And vanish it away. Vapor is real short. Don't see it for very long. Later today, you might not be here. Later today, they may not be here. They may be in hell. Why? Because in, over in chapter 5, verse 20, it says... 
that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save the soul from death and tithe a multitude of sins. They're hidden under Christ, under his blood. But you'll save that sinner from death. Yet we're not willing to go just a little bit out of our way to do it. Why? Because of in verse 14, it says you're ignorant of the future. You don't know the future. Why? Because in verse 14, it says life is short. Both yours and theirs. Verse, why? Because verse 15, God holds life in his hand. And you don't know, but he knows. And if he pricks your heart about someone, that may be their last day. They, that may be their last moment. And you could bring them to Christ before they die. Why? Because verse 7 of chapter 5, the Lord is coming back. And it says we're it says, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruits of the earth and hath long patience for it. God has patience for it, but we need to have patience for it too. And we need to see when... God, God will tell, tell us when there's a soul that's ready for Christ. He'll tell us when that early and latter rain has happened. And we can bring that soul to Christ. Why? Because in verse 8, it doesn't just say that the Lord is coming back, but it says the Lord's return is nigh. It could happen this moment. And at that point, we can't win another soul to Christ. Not a single soul that we didn't tell. Now, every one of those souls has just a sliver of an opportunity to come to Christ. And it's not nearly the opportunity that they could have had if we would have just spoken up. For some of you guys that are going to school, going back into the public school, Just living out your faith in Christ can bring a soul to. Maybe if it not be Christ, it'll bring them to church. It can bring them to church, which can, which will, which the fervent, which the fervent, effectual prayer will bring them to Christ. When was the last time you tried to talk to a soul? Tried to lead someone to Christ? For just one more soul were to walk down the aisle, it would be worth every struggle. It would be worth every mile. A lifetime of labor is still worth it all. Because it rescues just one more soul. Next time God tugs on your heart, next time God calls you, don't just ignore it. Answer, talk to that young man or young girl or maybe even older man or older young lady. Go talk to them. You may not get very far in the gospel, but the seed is and you can have a part in reaping a harvest for Christ
Every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor? Pastor?